Good evening from Cambridge. Uh, my name is John Nelson Wright, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all um, to this uh, webinar on the future of the Pacific Regional Order, which is co-hosted by the Center for Geopolitics and the East-West Center uh, in Hawaii. Um, today, we are privileged to uh, meet to, to um, have a number of distinguished speakers to talk on the topic of the future of the Pacific Regional Order. Um, to an audience that uh, stretches from the Pacific uh, through Europe to North America. So um, we hope this will be a very fascinating and illuminating discussion. Our topic, uh, the future of the Pacific regional order, covers a variety of different themes. Um, first of all, of course, the obvious question of geopolitical tensions, rivalry between the United States and its allies, and concerns of the growing, about the growing presence of China in the region. Uh, but of course, it's much more than just geopolitics. It's also questions to do with the climate crisis, the development needs of countries in the region, and perhaps most importantly of all for our discussion, uh, the question of how should Pacific Island states cooperate both internally and with external partners. Um, for our discussion, as I said, we have four distinguished speakers. Allow me to introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. Um, first of all, Stephen Rotuva is Pro Vice Chancellor Pacific as well as Distinguished Professor and Director of the Macmillan Brown Centre for Pacific Studies. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand and Chair of the International Political Science Association Research Committee on Climate Security and Planetary Politics. Um, he's also a member of a number of important public boards, uh, and he has had an extensive international engagement as a consultant or an advisor to UNDP, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, Pacific Island Forum, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the Inter International Labour Organization and others. His interests are um, very broad and interdisciplinary, spanning a number of disciplines, including sociology, social anthropology, development studies, political science and history. Um, second, our second speaker is Professor Yvonne underhill Sam, a Cook Island New Zealander, um, she is a Pacific feminist decolon decolonial development geographer um, uh, working at the University of Auckland, where she teaches Pacific studies, gender studies, and development studies. She's currently involved in a research project on climate mobility in some 18 communities across seven countries in the Pacific. In 2022, she was awarded the Metka Medal from the Royal Society of New Zealand in recognition of her intellectual leadership on gendered social relations, transforming development as accepted practice in the Pacific. Third, we have um, Associate Professor Anna Poles at the Center for Defense and Security Studies at Massey University in New Zealand. She specializes in geopolitical dynamics in the Pacific, Pacific security architecture, security cooperation in the Pacific, conflict and non-state actors in the Pacific, and New Zealand foreign and defense policies. She's authored a number of papers in journals, including International Affairs, Asia Policy, International Relations of the Asia Pacific, and Georgetown Journal of Asian Affairs. Uh, last but not least, um, Professor David Peebles, who has been um, academically and professionally involved in Pacific issues for almost 30 years. He worked for the Office of the Pacific in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs where his responsibilities included some of the most critical Pacific strategic issues, including climate change and oceans, the Pacific Island forums, and Australia's overall Pacific policy. He also served as the Deputy High Commissioner in the Solomon Islands, Minister Councillor in Indonesia, and as a Peace Monitor in Bougainville as part of the Regional Peace Monitoring Group. So we have a very distinguished panel with an immense amount of collective experience to discuss our topic. Um, each speaker will talk for approximately 15 minutes, um, after which we will have about half an hour for Q&A. For audience members, if I can encourage you to include your questions and um, points that you might want to raise in that half an hour using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, but for now, um, let me hand over to our first speaker, Stephen Rituva. Professor Rituva. Oh, well, thanks so much, uh, John, um, Nielsen Wright, and uh, uh, greetings from uh, 
South Island of New Zealand, uh, Christchurch. The weather here is very uh, a bit gloomy. Uh, yesterday it was lovely, bit unpre very unpredictable weather here, almost like Pacific politics. That's where I want to start. The uh, uh, certain things are predictable, certain things are not. Uh, my presentation for the next 15 minutes uh, would be largely in two phases. The first is a uh, uh, very uh, quick overview, if you like, the horizontal historical evolution or changes, transformation of uh, some of the major events in the Pacific leading to now from the Cold War period. <laughs> Sorry. And then uh, also I'll be looking at uh, very briefly the, uh, um, if you like, the multi-layered vertical uh, dynamics of politics in the region and how uh, these two, if you like, faces uh, weave into each other and help to, uh, I suppose, when you're talking about the future of the Pacific, um, which is the focus of this particular discussion, um, the future is in the past. The future is in the present. The future does not exist on its own. So what we do today will become the future by tomorrow. So uh, I think it's very important to look at some of the uh, dynamics of geopolitics of uh, of history in the last few years and how that might give you an idea of what might happen uh, in the future. Very, very briefly, um, of course, the, the Cold War uh, was very much fought in the Pacific as well as in other parts of the world. On one hand, you have the United States uh, and, uh, and, and the Soviet Union uh, and in the middle, uh, the Pacific. So the Pacific was also used as a testing ground for nuclear weapons by the United States, by Britain, by France. And uh, those had a lot of impact on Pacific people in terms of the security. So while uh, nuclear testing was meant to uh, make the world, if you like, from the point of view of those involved, uh, more secure, actually uh, uh, in the Pacific itself, it was seen as uh, creating a climate of insecurity. It was uh, also a period, particularly in the 1970s, uh, uh, with the emergence of the uh, of the people's movement, the nuclear free and independence movement as a reaction against what was happening around the, the Cold War period. It was a mixture of not just nuclear testing, it was also colonialism, a nuclear colonialism, which associated with Americans and of course the, the, the French as well. Um, uh, and, and indeed the British, because they were testing their bombs in their territories, in the colonies. So, uh, uh, yes, and of course, in the post-Cold War period, <clears throat> very quickly, uh, uh, particularly uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, as we all know, uh, there's a new phase of the 9-11 uh, uh, the and post-9-11 security dynamics in the Pacific, uh, where the, uh, the security framing of the Pacific differed considerably from the uh, Cold War period, where uh, Australia in particular began to see the Pacific as a security buffer. The term arc of instability came into existence where Australian uh, uh, st strategic thinkers, they saw the Pacific as being the sources of, uh, of terrorism, where from the Pacific uh, was where they would breed and then attack Australia at some point. But that, of course, uh, was a, a fallacious argument uh, when, in fact, a lot of the uh, uh, the so-called terrorist cells were located within Australia itself. So the post-Cold War period, uh, uh, so, so in terms of, so everything was uh, framed along the lines of, uh, of the post-9-11 uh, framing of the world. And then, um, of course, by the, uh, by the, uh, uh, the 2000, uh, and after that, uh, the, the emergence of China, uh, which redefined politics in the Pacific in a significant way. China's uh, role in the Pacific has been there for a long, 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 long time, since the 1800s. Uh, but it was only uh, in recent years, particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and China saw itself as being a growing power, uh, not only in the Pacific, but globally, through its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. That was when things began to change a little bit. Uh, in terms of contestation of geopolitics in the Pacific, of strategic interests, uh, which um, redefined the Pacific as an ocean of, uh, if you like, security contestation. Now, uh, and of course, fourth was in response to China, was the emergence of the Indo-Pacific concept, 
uh, which is still in existence now, the Indo-Pacific is really an Indochina framing of, of, of the world. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the two basically, basically two agreements associated with the Indo-Pacific uh, narrative. The first is the Quad, uh, India, uh, Japan, um, the United States and Australia. And of course, AUKUS, which is the latest uh, focus of, of, uh, of debates, particularly in the upper part of the world, uh, including New Zealand, whether New Zealand should, uh, uh, should, should join the Australian, uh, UK and US alliance called AUKUS. Because AUKUS has, uh, a, uh, has two pillars. Uh, one is the, uh, the nuclear pillar. Australia wants to build a number of uh, nuclear submarines. They said it's uh, non-nuclear uh, in terms of armament, but uh, that is still to be seen. And secondly, is the uh, what they refer to as a non-nuclear uh, technology exchange uh, a pillar. Uh, that's the pillar which New Zealand wants to uh, uh, to join, particularly with the new government discussions that have been going on. But then the issue there is to deal with New, new Zealand's nuclear-free policy. Uh, which uh, from the 1980s, 85, uh, later, later in 86, so 87, uh, New Zealand became a nuclear free state. And how does that uh, fit into the new thinking about joining AUKUS? So there's a lot of controversy around that, particularly also when New Zealand was a signatory together with Australia and the Pacific Island states of the uh, uh, Nuclear Free Zone Treaty, the Rarotonga Treaty, which was, which was signed in um, uh, 1986. So, uh, uh, so very, very quickly, uh, that is, if you like, the historical uh, 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 summary of the Pacific layout. And then where to from here? I think one of the things which we fail to look at is the, uh, in all this uh, geopolitical contestation and framing of the Pacific is the role of Pacific agency. Where do the states in the Pacific come in? Uh, in terms of, of, uh, of the geopolitics. Now, they have, uh, in many ways, uh, gone through a process of, uh, of uh, building up resilience and engaging with big powers in different ways, because different the big powers, China and Taiwan, and of course, Americans, Australia on one hand, and China, uh, have tried to use the Pacific states as pawns to be able to leverage their political and strategic interests in the Pacific. And for UN, UN, uh, UN, uh, UN uh, votes and, and, and so forth. But uh, uh, on the other hand, civic states have been able to uh, uh, play the game as well, take from here and there. It's a way of making sure that they don't fall into one particular ideological camp, which will be a liability for them in terms of being able to autonomously pursue what they want in this geopolitical game. Uh, and certainly uh, the Pacific has come up with a uh, the uh, uh, the uh, sorry uh, the new strategy uh, of the number of them in the past the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, 2050 blue Pacific strategy uh, which spells out how what the future looks like in the Pacific in relation to governance in relation to security in relation to uh, uh, climate change and of course climate change is one of the big issues of security in the Pacific. Of the Pacific Island Forum uh, in 2018 passed a resolution which identified climate is uh, one of, in fact, the most significant security issue in the Pacific long term, of course, because a lot of small islands are going to be inundated. Uh, some are going through a lot of stressful uh, uh, impact of climate change, not only in terms of uh, environmental impact, the social impact, the cultural impact, the economic impact, the food security, water security impact, and so forth. So the future in terms of uh, climate change um, uh, is quite bleak. And that's where a lot of resources are needed. That's where a lot of focus are needed in terms of policy direction, in terms of leveraging whatever power and means that we have to address those. So uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the question on uh, order, that's the one of the focus of this discussion. Uh, the Pacific has to be seen in different lights. Uh, often we just see the geopolitical, international, regional contestation. The other layers as well. There are the national layers of politics. Uh, countries in the Pacific have been going through their own 
internal challenges in relation to governance, in relation to uh, economic development, issues of poverty and health, as well as at a much more localized level uh, within the communities. So all these things, in some ways, they connect with each other, uh, and they do uh, provide the basis on which the future of the Pacific has to be understood, uh, because poverty, because of health, climate change, all these things will transform Pacific communities at the uh, community level, at the national level, at the regional level uh, in the future. So I think it's important to see things in with multi-layered lenses, uh, multidisciplinary lenses in terms of uh, of the way in which uh, where the Pacific is going. Now, uh, I understand that time is running out very, very fast, but I'll try to, uh, uh, to finish off uh, with uh, engagement of the Pacific with what's happening around the world now, particularly uh, in the war, for instance, in uh, um, in the Middle East, the, uh, the, the Palestine-Israeli conflict, and uh, the votes in the United Nations uh, have shown that quite a number of Pacific countries have been voting for uh, for Israel. Um, it changed a bit in the second vote in December from the November vote, uh, but then that uh, also has been an area of uh, of debate and contestation uh, at the global, also at the regional level. So, uh, uh, so in many ways, uh, that's where politics and religion, particularly the uh, uh, evangelical uh, Christian influence in the Pacific, uh, intertwines and 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 weaves together with politics and the way in which some of those religious uh, 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 thinking. Uh, shapes foreign policy as well, and of course the uh, the role of the United States in uh, in 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 a, in a very uh, indirect way, uh, moving the thinking towards Israel rather than towards uh, uh, having, uh, if you like, a much broader view of the Middle Eastern conflict in terms of bringing about peace and order in the part of the world. So yes, certainly the number of uh, last but not least a number of things that we have to look at in terms of the future of the. Uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, if you like the stability in the Pacific and the future security of the Pacific, one is to do with climate change and the way in which it's going to transform Pacific societies in significant ways, economically, culturally, politically as well, uh, and so forth. That will impact on regional politics in the Pacific. Uh, and secondly, how the internal dynamics within the countries themselves will play out. And thirdly. Uh, the implications of uh, the big power contestation in the Pacific with China, the United States, Australia, and AUKUS, of course, coming in to play, uh, and the way in which uh, all these big powers trying to use small uh, the, the states in the Pacific is part of the way in which they want to legitimize their presence in the Pacific. Uh, and fourth uh, is the uh, the fear of uh, the re remilitarization of the Pacific through AUKUS. And AUKUS uh, may sound uh, like a uh, just a geopolitical strategic uh, exercise, but uh, this fear that it could turn out to be uh, part of the uh, process of remilitarization of the Pacific. So uh, it's multi-layered. There are all kinds of uh, actors, all kinds of levels at which we have to look at the future of the Pacific in relation to uh, um, the coming regional order or disorder depends very much on how you frame it. And I'll probably stop there and uh, certainly I look forward to questions. And uh, if there are gaps in what I've said, of course, my colleagues are going to, I'm sure, gleefully um, expand on those or do a better job. Uh, thanks so much uh, for listening. And thank you so much, John, for the opportunity. Stephen, thank you very much for giving us that extraordinary comprehensive overview and reminding us of the importance of setting things in a historical context uh, and also highlighting the fluid nature of many of the key challenges that countries in the region face. Um, I was particularly struck by your reference to agency, and that seems particularly important at a time when great power politics is undergoing so much change, and there are real concerns about um, changes in the direction of American foreign policy and looking ahead to the election in November, perhaps concerns about disengagement on the part of the United States. I'm sure we'll want to come back to 
those themes and the other ones that you raised. But for now, let me um, thank you and pass on to Yvonne, um, who's going to take our discussion perhaps in a in a in a more focused direction. Thank you. Uh, warm greetings to everyone. Um, I'm coming in from um, Rarotonga in the Cook Islands, and I'm really delighted to be um, able to contribute to this discussion. Um, most importantly, thanks um, John and Connor for setting this up and giving um, giving us an opportunity. You know, Steve and Anna and I we do work together, and it's really nice to be able to join this conversation um, and and sort of add more nuance to I think the direction that we all uh, we know we need to be going. Um, I want to say thanks again, Steve, for your um, mastery once again in providing that kind of historical overview and highlighting the way in which in the Pacific we talk about um, walking backwards into the future uh, because everything we do know about the future, um, many of those things have been laid out already and we need to know how to see them, identify them and understand how they continue to be embedded in some of the um, ongoing struggles for, uh, for power in the region. What I want to do in my very short time is to continue with the discussion that Steve started in terms of the scales of analysis, highlighting the kind of agencies we need to pay attention to, um, and importantly, bring a, um, a feminist perspective in this, which asks us to really pay attention also to the bodies that are being affected. So I want to make sure that the kind of feminist analysis that we bring in this is not simply layered at that level of, um, of bodies, which it has in the past, and though it's very important, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but also to the, the way in which it does understand the material impacts of um, those kinds of uh, geopolitical um, tussles and leadership tussles at our regional level, but also at our sub-regional levels and our community levels. Many of our uh, communities are still dominated mostly by um, male-centered leadership uh, approaches. Many of them, uh, there are many struggles still um, in those spaces. And once again, coming to a place like the Cook Islands, a home for me, where to all intents and purposes, there seems to be a, it's a modern thriving democratic system. Once you start stepping into these places, once again, you can begin to see the, um, the, the, the stresses and strains that are happening at community levels. So what I wanted to start off with, and for instance, right at this very moment, um, when so much is happening around the world, um, the Cook Island government has signed off a new bill, which changes the, a new act, which talks about seabed harvesting, as opposed to seabed mining. And that discursive shift um, is an interesting one because we often talk about harvesting as being quite a good thing in some ways. But the most important thing about that was it was in response really to a very effective civil society movement here in the Cook Islands that has continued um, to draw attention to the impacts of that. So I wanted to focus in my little um, time here on two particular movements that have been led by women and are often underestimated in terms of the impact they have made globally and therefore how that comes back to affect our countries. And those two, Steve has already mentioned, is the campaign for um, against nuclear disarmament. And Dr. Uh, Vanessa Griffin, who is a colleague of um, many of ours and has been at USP when, in the time that Steve was also working there, um, has continued on the campaign to have ratified at that global level, the campaign um, against nuclear, uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And it's been highly successful. And I just wanted to, um, draw attention to the fact that really do we understand Vanessa's role in that as one that's deeply um, underpinned by her feminist concerns and understanding of how these um, those environmental impacts and, and nuclear testing in, in particular affect bodies today and will continue to do so in the future. In the Northern Pacific where those bombs were nuclear bombs were tested, we are still having jelly babies that are built, uh, that are being born, babies that are born as a kind of a, a sludge of, with no particular shape, and of course, which die very quickly. There are still very high levels of cancer, and there are very large numbers of people who are unable to have children. So this is a very real 
um, event that's happening right day right now after over 50 years later after from those nuclear um, tests and so Vanessa has been one of many who has been able to maintain a momentum behind that movement globally when many times in our region it gets um, it, it, it doesn't have the same attention. So her role has been important. She is a feminist. She's continued to that. She's part of a movement both in the region, which at times, as I said, has, has vacillated in its support. But there's absolutely no doubt that the ongoing uh, understanding of the material impacts of, um, of, you know, that, of, of nuclear weapons two generations ago are still being felt now. And that's a really clear message for us to say it matters what happens to our bodies because it lasts for a long time. Closely related to that, but at the very other end, and many of you may have been aware of the um, of the troubles that had affect, have affected the urban area of, of um, Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea, but more recently, the very tragic slaughtering of a lot of tribe, uh, a lot of people in the Tari district of, of the Highlands, um, where high powered weapons and drones were used. To, um, to, to, to kill uh, members of another tribe. This is highly sophisticated uh, warfare that is um, undertaken with weapons that don't come from Papua New Guinea. So there's the flow of weapons in there, the flow of technology for, for that kind of level of, uh, of, of, of violence to occur. And amongst all of this, there has been um, a, a woman's, a feminist woman's group who called Voice for Change and Lily De Basoya has been a key person there who's been working with many of the victims, I would say, but also survivors of that small gun violence. And, you know, we know the definition of small gun is not, is much bigger than that. Um, but she's also been a tireless um, advocate working, understanding what's happening in her own neighbourhood, in her own communities, and, and maintaining the kind of, um, the importance of knowing what's happening, building the capacity, enabling the agency of mostly women and children in this war-torn area that we only hear about in these kind of snippets of tragedy. But she understands also that these are ongoing daily events that many women have to have to deal with, and she's been quite involved in the whole the whole um, campaign uh, to, um, to to reduce small arms globally. So those are just two examples of how a feminist approach to some of these geopolitical stuff are very clearly able to connect uh, the material impact on our bodies, not just in terms of bodies that die and bleed and hurt, but also what gets into our DNA and lasts for many generations. And so linking that to the flow of weapons, the geopolitical um, means by which we can um, start to understand um, the impact in our regions. So I think that that's kind of the main point I wanted to make is that when we start to look more closely, we can also see in our region some difficult situations, but amongst that difficult situation, there is, if we want to use the word agency, there is a considerable amount of agency that comes from a politics of care and a politics of determination to, um, to ensure that um, the issues in, their, in, their, in, in communities and local communities are connected to global issues, which are around nuclear weapons, proliferation, and the proliferation of small arms. Um, I want to, those are the two main points um, I'd like to really make. The, the current research that we're doing around, um, you know, many communities in the Pacific um, also give us pause to think both about the kind of resilience that the communities are, are exhibiting, their understanding of where their futures are, is very sophisticated. And the victimhood mentality is less evident when the realities of decision making within communities are being made. And again, once you look backwards at the future, you begin to see the relationships that communities have made over time. Most communities in the Pacific have moved in some shape or form over the time, their lived history time. And it's those invoking those sorts of relationships, looking after those sorts of relationships are the way we're gonna better understand 
the comfort with which people want to move to other places in their own time, in ways. And, that, and that's what, something we could see um, already happening. So um, I'm happy also to pause here and invite um, questions as they come. But um, yeah, so those are my three points. One, if we look closely, we can see movements. They are often led by feminists. They um, do make the connection from the, geo, the, geo, the, the, the global through the regional um, down to the community, and they are very effective in, in doing that. And secondly, that looking again, uh, looking backwards to the future, we can start to map out the kinds of relationships that communities have had in the past, which will be an important thing for them to, for, for us to understand as we pivot towards um, the different places people may need to live, may need to live in the um, in the future. So I, I shall leave it there. Over to you, John. Yvonne, thank you for a um, a fascinating and inspirational um, presentation. I think remind us of the importance of civil society. I was struck by, by two things in your remarks that perhaps we will revisit in the Q&A. One is your characterization of politics as a politics of care and determination, because so often politics is often framed as a politics driven by anger and resentment when we think of populist politics and how that's fueling a sense of division. Um, and as part of that process, and this relates to, I think, again, your very um, illuminating quote, walking backwards into the future, how often nostalgia is weaponized as a basis for reinforcing those divisions and rivalries within uh, increasingly fractured polities. And I think you remind us with your observations, it doesn't have to be that way. The past can be inspirational. Um, and it can create a foundation for a politics that is inherently more constructive and affirmative. So um, thank you for introducing that theme. We'll want to come back to it, I'm sure. Um, uh, let's move on um, to Anna, who's going to um, give her presentation. Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tanakoto uh, Kato, it's a pleasure to, to be uh, joining this distinguished panel from Aotearoa. And I'd like to just start by, of course, uh, thanking the hosts, uh, the Centre for Geopolitics at Cambridge University, and of course, uh, the East West Centre, uh, and John and Connor for, for bringing us together. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the comments made by, by Steve and, 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 and Yvonne and thank them for for really setting the foundations for a fascinating uh, and nuanced conversation. My comments are, are going to focus a little bit more around the security and, and geopolitics uh, side of, uh, of this conversation and offering some reflections on the future of the Pacific Regional Order and the way in which since 2017, the Pacific Regional Order has been under increasing pressure. Now, the 2023 uh, Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Communique uh, came out of the meeting late last year in Rarotonga in Cook Islands. Uh, it captured the principal uh, competing interests within the regional order when it noted the tension between the impact of global and geostrategic issues on the region, national economic and development priorities, and the ability of the region to manage issues in a manner that maintains the solidarity of the region and the sovereignty of each forum member. So my comments, as I said, will focus on, on the security and geopolitical tensions at play within the regional order. But it's important to keep in mind, as Steve and Yvonne have both reminded us today, that these tensions are not in isolation. Increasingly, they will intersect with other challenges, whether that be climate change, uh, national and subnational interests, community interests, and so forth. So the future of the regional order in the Pacific uh, will in part be defined by how the regional architecture responds and manages geopolitical risk. And a quick point of clarification here. By regional architecture, although we, we've uh, long understood it in very state-centric terms, it needs to be uh, encompassing civil society, academia, non-state actors, community uh, groups, the church and, and so forth. And this is fundamentally important and it has been recognized in a number of Pacific Islands Forum documents that the regional architecture needs to 
be far more inclusive of non-state voices as well. Uh, now, you know, in many respects, more than ever. Geopolitical tensions will continue to rise uh, globally, and the Pacific is by no means immune to the challenges this poses. The 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, which was adopted by the Pacific Islands Forum in 2022, noted that the Pacific occupies a, quote, vitally significant place in global strategic terms, and that consequently heightened geopolitical competition was impacting Pacific countries. And in the past few years, we've seen how this has manifested in a number of ways. The COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine highlighted Pacific countries' global dependencies and the challenges in achieving resilience in supply chains. Pacific countries themselves have come under increasing pressure to make difficult choices in terms of al alignment and have repeatedly raised their concerns that geopolitical competition is shrinking their strategic choices and that their ability to hedge and balance between strategic competitors will become increasingly constrained. Moreover, there are legitimate fears that geopolitical competition will intersect with existing conflict dynamics and destabilize hard-won peace. And this is particularly evident as partner countries such as Australia and China compete for influence in the security sectors such as that in Solomon Islands. And we also saw in Tonga last year in response to the eruption and tsunami, the way in which humanitarian assistance and disaster relief has become a growing vector for geopolitical competition, and that will only likely increase. Moreover, as oceans gain geostrategic importance, the maritime regional order in the Pacific will also become come under increasing pressure and maritime security governance will play a pivotal role uh, here. And of course, resource security and geoeconomics, the relationship between economics and security. We've seen how this has played out in, the re in reference to fisheries. And of course, uh, Yvonne has just mentioned sea mining and deep sea mining is forecast to account for at least one third of the supply of critical minerals necessary for the energy transition and the Pacific is going to be very much at the heart of this. Moreover, and this is fundamentally important, there are competing visions of what the Pacific regional order is and this is very much emerged as a, as a consequence of both geopolitical competition but also in terms of the way in which the Pacific region certainly over the past 30 years has been carving out a very set of priorities and identities and this relates to the comments that Steve made with respect to Pacific agency. In response to the pressures on the Pacific regional order Pacific Islands Forum has developed a stable of declarations and frameworks which seek to anchor Pacific leadership and agendas at the core of the regional order. For example, the 2017 Forum Leaders Meeting endorsed the Blue Pacific Identity as the core driver of collective action under the framework for Pacific regionalism, followed a year later. And in 2018, with the adoption of the Boy Declaration on Regional Security, which acknowledged the dynamic geopolitical environment leading to an increasingly crowded and complex region, but importantly centered an expanded concept of security at the heart of it, which was informed by Pacific priorities. Now, partners such as Australia and New Zealand and the United States have adopted and in some cases appropriated elements of the Pacific regional order such as the blue pacific through the partners in the blue pacific initiative and in fact, the notion of pacific islands forum centrality which is you know, akin to uh, asean centrality for example the partners in the blue pacific is an example of an initiative which seeks to amplify pif centrality however conversely has been criticized for co-opting the blue pacific narrative and undermining both pif centrality and pacific priorities the idea of PIF centrality emerged in the last two years and seeks to advance and, and safeguard the centrality of the Pacific Islands Forum in much the same way as ASEAN centrality is institutionalized as the dominant regional platform to overcome common challenges and engage with external partners. Now, the idea isn't new, but it, and it captures and co-ops long-standing calls by the Pacific for external partners including Australia and New Zealand, to coordinate through the Pacific Islands Forum, noting, of course, that New Zealand and Australia are members. And it is frequently invoked by these countries, such as Aotearoa, Australia and the US, who seek to use it to reinforce their legitimacy within the regional order. In the case of Australia and New Zealand as well, 
Perth's centrality is a useful tool to shape or at least attempt to shape how partners such as the United States engage in the Pacific. So there is a critical distinction between the ways in which Pacific countries have developed strategic narratives to uphold a Pacific-led regional order and the strategic narratives of partners. While there is support for PIF centrality, there may be less support for a Pacific-led regional order where it cuts across the strategic objectives of partner countries. And I'm thinking specifically here about the role of the North Pacific in US defense strategy and the work of scholars such as Ken Cooper at the University of Guam, and of course, the debate around AUKUS, which Steve has mentioned. Now, of course, in 2022, we know that China also sought to advance a regional, an alternative regional order, when prior to the China Pacific Island countries foreign ministers meeting, China proposed the China Pacific Islands Common Development Vision, with the aim of the draft communique being adopted shortly thereafter at the foreign ministers meeting. Now, the vision reflected an evolution in how China engages with the Pacific, shifting from Beijing's preferred bilateral mode of engagement to multilateralism. And the Common Development Vision sought to really sort of reshape the regional order in the Pacific Islands through the advancement and close alignment of ambitious security and economic initiatives. And it really reflected the amalgamation of its statecraft efforts across all spheres. Now, as I said, the, the Common Development Vision was rejected by Pacific leaders. Uh, it did reveal the, the scope of, of Beijing's interests in, in the Pacific uh, and certainly raised some concerns about the security elements to that. The rejection of the proposal by Pacific leaders reflected concerns about the comprehensive security elements of the pact uh, and also about the lack of consensus built through the discussions. Now, we may also see a return to that uh, when uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, visits the region again this year. Uh, it is entirely possible that we'll see additional efforts to advance the elements of that, uh, even though there has been a doubling down at the sub-regional, at the, sorry, at the bilateral uh, level. Geopolitical competition has also manifested in a number of ways from growing diplomatic engagement to the rapid increase in security activities and engagement in the Pacific. And as we've heard, Pacific leaders and civil society have voiced their concerns about the impact of militarization and securitization of the Pacific, whether that be AUKUS or Article 4 of the Falepili Union between Australia and Tuvalu. Data collected by the Pacific Defence Diplomacy Tracker, which is a research project I'm involved with, uh, in with Tess Newton Kane at uh, the Griffith University in Australia and Teddy Wren in Papua New Guinea, charts the trajectory of defence activities in the Pacific and clearly identifies a significant increase in tempo from 2022 onwards, as well as the type of activities partner countries prioritise. So, for example, between 2018 and 2023, China prioritized medical military diplomacy activities across the five Pacific countries in the study, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Solomon Islands, Tonga and Vanuatu. And from 2021, increased the number of training act activities, including from, including with a greater focus on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief training, as well as military policing engagement. The United States, for example, has increased its maritime security presence with the deployment of the U.S. Coast Guard to the Pacific, including the basing of Qatar and Samoa, uh, as well as the signing of defense agreements, uh, including the uh, not uh, uncontroversial agreement with Papua New Guinea uh, late last year. And that increase in maritime security presence by the United States very much reflects my earlier comments about the role of the maritime domain uh, as an increasingly geostrategic importance in the region. And here we see through these various defense uh, type uh, activities, uh, the emphasis on presence by, by these partner countries. For uh, our UK viewers, for instance, there has been a significant uptick in defense diplomacy uh, throughout 2023. Uh, including visits, bilateral disaster response exercises and leadership training, which reflects increased UK interest in the region. And other countries such as France and Japan have similarly increased their defense diplomacy activities, reflecting broader strategic objectives. What the data doesn't tell us and what the next phase of the project is, is whether the types of defense diplomacy activities we are seeing in the region actually meet the security needs and priorities of the Pacific recipients. And this will also be revealing uh, in terms of 
whether or not that security presence and partnerships also equates to any type of substantive uh, influence, for instance. So the heightened geopolitical competition and the intersecting nature of security challenges in the Pacific that will certainly create uh, increasing tension in particular sites. In the security sector, for instance, as I mentioned before, is one such site uh, in Solomon Islands, and we're likely to see that increasingly as we have competing security stakeholders seeking to provide security assistance to countries where uh, in the case of Solomon Islands, there is a recent history of conflict and instability. And so this potential for strategic, strategic competition to become increasingly dis disruptive is considerable. And, and uh, in late 2022, the Pacific Islands Forum assessed that, uh, that these tensions are likely to increase, that major powers are likely to continue to compete for influence to protect and promote their own interests in the Pacific uh, islands region. And as I mentioned at the outset, this the future of the regional order in the Pacific will in part be defined by how the regional architecture responds to and manages this geopolitical risk. And in response to this, the 2050 strategy implementation plan called for a review of the regional security architecture and the strengthening of security policy arrangements and architecture in the region through, for example, a regional security mechanism and greater coordination between regional security secretariats, such as the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat and the Melanesian Spearhead Group Secretariat. And it's important to note here that this is also taking place uh, against a, a backdrop of uh, reform and intentions that had emerged from 2021, uh, a rule were all existed beforehand, but certainly spilled over in 2021 when the Micronesian members of the forum uh, proposed exiting from that. And then the path back through resolution under the Suva agreement and then bringing Kibas back in as well last year. So there has been an enormous amount of flux taking place at the regional and sub-regional levels as well. And so that geopolitical comp competition that's taking place is also a significant distraction from actually dealing with key issues uh, at stake. In 2023, the Pacific Island Forum leaders passed its secretariat to develop Fiji Prime Minister Sitiveni Ramboka's concept of a zone of peace for consideration at this year's forum meeting in Tonga in, in August. So there has been enormous pressure being put on the regional architecture to come up with ways of managing geopolitical risk, ways of managing partners, uh, and effectively kind of crisis, the type of kind of crisis management tools uh, that we've seen in other regions such as Southeast Asia. And the ability of the regional architecture to match the ambitions of the region's leaders will really be a determining factor in the future of, of the regional order. Because of course, there are significant implications uh, if the regional architecture is unable to, to do so. So there's a clear need uh, to for stronger crisis management mechanisms to manage those geopolitical frictions in the region so we don't become, as Steve suggested, a, a, re a region of disorder, regional disorder. And this could be, for instance, through a code of conduct or some other type of regional mechanism. So even though this, this uh, is a, I've, I've given sort of a slight sort of gloomy portrayal of the challenges testing the Pacific regional order. There are significant strengths within the region which far outweigh uh, the, the limitations that, that, that this suggests. And a, many of those strengths come from Pacific or as it's uh, also referred to sort of oceanic diplomacy as articulated through scholars such as Sala George Carter and Gordon Nanao and Anna Nalpa and Greg Fry. Uh, and these dynamics are frequently uh, inadequately understood or overlooked by the, the Pacific's partners, but are integral to actually uh, ensuring that the regional order and regionalism is a buffer to the type of geopolitical uh, challenges and risks that we will continue to face. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Anna, thank you very much. Um, and for reminding us of the importance of innovation in thinking about architecture um, and highlighting all of these local initiatives, um, which you know, I think reinforces the point that Yvonne was making about recognizing the importance of local contributions in dealing with 
an extraordinary fluid environment. Um, also, I think very helpfully to, to link what's happening um, in the Pacific with the role of European uh, actors, who increasingly, of course, are playing a presence in the region, which then leads on to the broader question of um, what are those European actors there to guard against in terms of security priorities, how, how those security risks, geopolitical risks are best defined, and whether they're there to meet immediate needs or to act in a way to deter and minimize the risk of security conflict. But I'm sure we'll come back to those issues. Can I encourage the audience also um, to keep your questions coming in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen? We'll want to collate those and bring those to the fore in the Q&A session. But let's move on, last but not least, to David, who's going to give the final presentation. David, over to you. Thanks very much, John. Uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, really wonderful to be with you today. And uh, my sincere thanks to John and to Connor. Um, some 20 years ago, I published a book called Pacific Regional Order. Uh, so I was really delighted to be invited, uh, invited to be on a panel on the future of the Pacific Regional Order, uh, particularly with such esteemed panellists. I think we've had a real masterclass from the three of them. So I'll try and come in, uh, come in behind them. Uh, but the panel's really been an opportunity for me to think about the Pacific's journey over the last 20 years and what the coming decades may bring. Uh, my book was partly a product of its times. It uh, very much uh, reflected the uh, cares and concerns of the early 2000s. Uh, I think the book only mentioned China twice and climate change and oceans policy didn't get uh, nearly the, the attention that it would today or probably even that they deserved at the time. Uh, so there's a lesson there for me about uh, not mistaking short-term developments for long-term structural trends. But my own humble efforts to think about Pacific regional order in the early 2000s uh, did have some things which I still hold to. Um, firstly, the absolute importance of the Pacific Islands Forum, the region's preeminent political institution, and that countries coming together would be central to meeting the challenges facing the region. And secondly, that Australia's approach to the Pacific needed to evolve, that Australia needed to bring a lot more to the table and needed to approach the Pacific Island countries in a much greater spirit of partnership and equality. So the thesis I would like to share with you today is that certain features of the Pacific region in coming decades are baked in. The effects of climate change are going to get worse rather than better. Likewise, strategic competition. Uh, many Pacific Island countries will continue to struggle with small governments with enormous responsibilities and development indicators vulnerable to inherent constraints, conflict, pandemics and climate change. So certain things are baked into the regional outlook. The thing that will determine whether the Pacific is marked by regional order or disorder in coming decades will be the response. Um, that's why the role of the Pacific Islands Forum and of Australia and of New Zealand will be critical. Uh, I should say, because uh, I share the panel with a New Zealander, and doubtless there are many New Zealanders in the audience, I, I really regard New Zealand's role as critical. Uh, but as a former Australian policymaker, I feel very comfortable making grand pronouncements about uh, Australia and what it should do. But uh, slightly more seriously, I think there's a lot to admire where uh, New Zealand already is in terms of its uh, relationship with the uh, Pacific. Let's turn firstly to the challenges that are baked in in coming decades. I'm going to take 2050 as my reference point, as has already been touched on. Um, this matches the timeline of the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, which leaders of the Pacific Islands Forum launched in 2022. Firstly, on climate change, which leaders have said is the Pacific single greatest threat. Uh, last year, the global temperature was 1.5 degrees higher than pre-industrial times. Um, so far, that's a one-off, uh, but it seems unlikely on current policy settings that global warming will be kept to 1.5 degrees. The Washington Post modelled 1,200 pathways for the world to shift to clean energy, uh, and only four out of 1,200 showed the world hitting the 1.5 degree target. 
The IPCC tells us that every tenth of a degree beyond 1.5 counts, and it seems we're going to go quite a bit beyond 1.5. As we know, for some Pacific Island countries, sea level rise is an existential threat. Uh, but for all countries, extreme weather will bring destruction and death. Uh, I was in Vanuatu last year when there were twin cyclones in the same week, and certainly the property damage afterwards looked like a small war. So the Pacific of 2050 is likely to see frequent extreme weather events, food and water shortages, and more Pacific Islanders migrating to other countries because of climate change. On strategic competition by 2050, we will know whether the US and China managed to negotiate an equilibrium while avoiding a hot war, or whether there was a disastrous conflict over Taiwan or something else. Regardless, the wider Indo-Pacific will be host to many great powers, the US, China, Russia, India, Indonesia, possibly Japan, possibly Korea. The Pacific will continue to be crowded space. Uh, forum members, these very large oceanic states, account for nearly 20% of the world's surface. That inevitably attracts the attention of great powers for resources, for transport across sea lanes, for strategic geography. Uh, there is no returning to the 1990s. The days of a unipolar or even bipolar world are behind us. Uh, to me, a fractious multipolarity is more likely which will play out in the Pacific as well. And by 2050, many of the existing development constraints will still apply, but made worse by climate change and other shocks. So it's a big trifecta, climate change, strategic competition, development. It's fair to say that Pacific Island countries will be dealing with some of the most complex challenges in human history in coming decades. If these are the baked in features of the Pacific in 2050, what is the difference between Pacific regional order and disorder? In the disorder scenario, uh, Pacific governments and communities do not have the resources for climate change mitigation and adaptation and do not have a migration safety net. Individual countries barely recover from one extreme weather event in time for the next one but the frequency means countries have little bandwidth for helping others in need. Uh, the Pacific is a playground for great powers who prosecute their interests country by country in the absence of a coherent regional response. Elites wait for the next best offer with often little obvious benefit for the community. The Pacific is dotted with great power military bases. Development cha challenges have already stretched Pacific budgets. Populations are sicker and poorer. Pacific Islands Forum meetings and the machinery continues, but the forum isn't seen as a fulcrum for the region and members disengage. Australia and New Zealand, beset by economic problems and escalating defence costs, don't have the resources nor inclination to be true members of the Pacific family. In the order scenario, international and regional resources are mobilised for Pacific climate change adaptation and mitigation, there was a regionally coordinated humanitarian disaster response mechanism, as Anna touched on. Uh, Australia and New Zealand have coordinated Pacific migration policies. There's a coherent regional response to strategic competition, and the Pacific lives up to its name as a zone of peace. The region agrees on a framework for tackling health and education challenges, including access to health and education systems in Australia and New Zealand. So order or disorder. Much depends on whether the Pacific Islands Forum at the centre can hold and whether Australia is willing and able to take on the full obligations and commitments of being a true member of the Pacific family. The Forum started in 1971. I'm a bit in love with the Forum and I'm a bit of a Forum groupie. So I reckon it's uh, an organisation that can point to many past achievements uh, from the decolonisation agenda to advocacy on nuclear testing and nuclear legacy issues uh, to negotiations for the Law of the Sea Convention, which established Pacific Island countries' extensive, exclusive economic zones, and the ongoing quest to ensure a just return for their fisheries resources, uh, to responding to security challenges in Solomon Islands with a regional peacekeeping mission, uh, to climate change advocacy and the COVID-19 response. When the forum speaks with one voice, it is powerful and effective. What are the preconditions for the forum to play a central role in upholding regional order between now and 2050? 
Firstly, the forum must be united. The forum has had two periods of disunity when Fiji was suspended from 2009 to 2014, and as Anne has touched on, the uh, when the five Micronesian members threatened to leave the forum over 2021 and 2022. Now, whatever you might think about the rights and the wrongs of that dispute, um, that was the issue that took up the forum's bandwidth over 2021 and 22, uh, rather than climate change, geopolitics or other issues. Uh, all regional institutions around the world are under pressure in the current period of geopolitics, but unity is a necessary precondition for managing the challenges. Second related point is that um, forum members must be willing to invest sovereignty in regional responses and commitments. It's the classic dilemma, uh, individual members at times willing to make sacrifices to uphold regional commitments so that everyone achieves an overall better result. There are no easy, cute answers to that, particularly uh, in a region where many states have become independent only relatively recently and upholding national sovereignty is a precious thing. Uh, thirdly, the forum has to have a plan that sticks. Uh, and I believe the forum's current plan, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, is that plan. The forum has had plans and vision statements before, but the 2050 strategy combines vision and a pathway to implementation. It's also the product of wide consultations. So I think the 2050 strategy is a plan that all members can unite behind. Turning now to Australia and what Australia needs to bring to the table to support Pacific order. Uh, Australia has a complex history with Pacific Island countries, both good and bad. Uh, the Australian Pacific effort has lifted since 2016, uh, initially driven by concerns to be a better neighbour and to support Pacific Island countries to improve development outcomes, and then also by concerns about strategic competition. That's not necessarily a bad thing as long as it leads to good policy. I think that's largely been the case. Uh, one thing that Australia uh, has changed is that it is now defining itself as being within the region as part of the Pacific family rather than viewing itself as an outside commentator. Uh, Australia's Pacific geography has always been obvious, but it's taken modern Australian political leaders a while to get there. There are many aspects to Australia being a true part of the Pacific family. One key test for me is whether over time Australia works towards the sort of generous migration arrangements that it extends to New Zealand to other members of the Pacific Islands Forum as well. I don't know about your family, but uh, in my family, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see my family members and I welcome them in through the front door. And uh, I think that's an analogy that's quite important. Um, when I wrote my book in the early 2000s, the most radical thing I could possibly imagine was that by 2020, there might be 10,000 seasonal workers from the Pacific in Australia. As at February 2023, there were 35,000 workers under the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility or PALM scheme. But access to the short-term labor market is only one aspect of countries having closer links. I'm careful about drawing analogies between regionalism in one part of the world, particularly Europe, and regionalism is in another part of the world. But I think there are a lot of lessons for Australia in how the EU approached the challenge of the immediate post-Cold War period and the hand of friendship it extended to the Central and Eastern European states. Western Europe could have kept the EU to itself. Uh, that would have been an understandable, if short-sighted, choice but instead it offered EU membership to the Central and Eastern European states, promoting development and the movement of goods, services and peoples. Yes, it made strategic and economic sense, but it was also driven by generosity and political courage. Good intentions and good strategy can combine. Can you imagine how different and unstable Central and Eastern Europe would look today without that offer of EU membership, particularly given Russia's depredations? That was a clear choice to pursue order over disorder. The new Australian government's Pacific Engagement Visa, which will grant 3,000 Pacific Islanders permanent residency each year, is a step in this direction. Another is the Australia Tuvalu Valapili Union Treaty signed last year, which established a framework for migrating with dignity in the face of climate change. I want to acknowledge too that New Zealand has been at this for a long time. Australia's Pacific Engagement Visa is quite explicitly modelled on New Zealand's Pacific Access Category Visa. 
and Cook Islands and Niue have freedom of movement and full access to New Zealand's health and education systems. One important thing for Australia will be to draw its bilateral efforts and its membership of the forum together. Capturing every aspect of Australia's bilateral relationships in a regional agreement is probably too much, but putting a framework before Pacific leaders of how Australia is going to work with the Pacific between now and 2050 would bring the regional and the bilateral together. So thank you, friends. There are some big issues there, all worthy of much longer consideration and debate. Uh, I look forward to your questions and frank feedback. It will all be very useful uh, as I attempt to talk my family into allowing me to write a sequel to my original Pacific Regional Order book from 20 years ago. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I do hope that the sequel will be forthcoming. Um, we have lots of questions, I'm sure. Um, and let me start, if I may, um, with a question from Marco de Jong, uh, who asks, what are some potential implications uh, arising from New Zealand's involvement in AUKUS Pillar 2 for Pacific regionalism and its priorities? Um, none of these questions are directed at anyone in particular, so I, I invite any member of the panel um, to, to perhaps respond to that question regarding AUKUS Panel 2, Pillar 2. Stephen, would you like to have a crack at that? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, maybe I should start and then the others can fill in and elaborate more on that. Uh, very interesting question. In fact, there's a question that's been uh, discussed, uh, particularly in New Zealand, the last few uh, few months. And uh, you know, there are a number of things here. One is uh, uh, the two levels of, if you like, narratives, uh, which uh, has been used to, to sell the... Uh, uh, the AUKUS idea to New Zealand. Uh, one is the political narrative uh, on security and um, alliances uh, and so forth. Um, so, uh, uh, and then you have, of course, the uh, another layer is the actual technological narrative. So the political narrative tries to distinguish between the, uh, if you like, the nuclear submarines and the technological aspect, the other pillar, the two pillars, the uh, uh, nuclear submarine pillar and the technology pillar. Uh, now, at the technological level, questions have been raised about, is there really a line of demarcation between the two pillars in terms of the way technology nowadays um, uh, uh, engage with each other? Like AI, for instance, will be used for technology as well as uh, certainly in the nuclear submarines, you're gonna use, we'll be using that. Uh, exchange of uh, of intelligence of information that'll be used uh, on both sides of the pillars anyway. So uh, we still have to be convinced uh, by the political narrative that there is really a distinction between the two. When in fact, a lot of those things in the exchange of information are actually gonna be needed by nuclear submarine anyway, whether different kinds of, um, of technology which are gonna be used. Uh, I mean, if you look at the military industrial complex, there's no line whatsoever between the, if you like, civilian technology and military technology. The, the, the big uh, uh, military uh, uh, contractors in the military industrial complex, as we know, are the big countries like, like Boeing and, um, uh, and Airbus, which make uh, weaponry systems or technology which fit into the weaponry system, although they may appear civilian. So that line of distinction between what is civilian technology and what is military technology no longer exists. In fact, a lot of the civilian technology started from the military, like internet started from the military uh, and so forth. And AI is used right across and intelligence used right across. So uh, uh, it's like splitting hair. So we still have to be convinced by this was selling the AUKUS idea particularly Australia selling it to New Zealand, as the distinction is clear. Now, one of the, the second uh, aspect of the question is given that, so Australia was, and of course, New Zealand, they were signatories to the Pacific Island, uh, nuclear free, free, so the Pacific Nuclear Free Zone Treaty in 1986. So uh, uh, one of the dangers is that this will reactivate the nuclearization of the Pacific. Uh, which the Pacific all the years uh, have been fighting against. Uh, and certainly the militarization of the Pacific, which we thought would have disappeared. And of course, 
The other issue here is escalation loop. So uh, what we've seen in the Pacific, as uh, I was talking about, I talk about as well, and uh, um, and Yvonne, was the way in which uh, there seemed to be a cycle of escalation. Uh, the so-called Western powers will do this, and China does this, and then uh, the others will go on and so forth. So the AUKUS is part of the escalation uh, in response to uh, uh, to the Belt and Road Initiative. And so I'm sure China is waiting to re-escalate to another level, um, you know, the given AUKUS. So you're going to see that uh, playing out in the Pacific. So we don't want to see another Cold War scenario in the Pacific. So, uh, yeah. So uh, those were some of the issues that we have to raise in relation to uh, AUKUS. And the way it's being sold, it's sold, of course, nowadays marketing. Politics and commercial marketing are very much part of the same game. Anyway, political leaders, they market themselves commercially. Uh, and of course, commercial uh, products are being marketed politically as well. So we see that playing out in AUKUS. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Anna, would you like to come in on this issue or do you have thoughts? Sure. No, th thank you, John. I do have thoughts. And, and thanks, Marco, for the question. Um, I think I'll probably just preface it by saying that uh, New, the, the prospect of New Zealand joining Pillar 2 is quite a way down the the road really and and uh the Australian Defence Minister Richard Miles made a comment um recently to the effect that that it, the decision to to broaden it out to other countries was was by no means um uh, fixed that said obviously we've had a, we've had a new Australian uh, uh, officials over in in New Zealand to discuss the elements of it uh and there has been a strong push by the new New Zealand uh, government uh, under Chris Luxon and the national um, coalition led coalition government um, to to really to to for want of a better term sort of get back into um, in, into bed with on on these issues and and come across very strong on defence issues. Now, the tension I think for for for, for many of us uh, is. Uh, and certainly the tension for the New Zealand government is how does it balance on the one hand uh, its number one relationship, which is with Australia. And New Zealand officials will always say this, that the number one relationship is with Australia. New Zealand, Australia is New Zealand's only ally uh, and it is the fundamentally important relationship. So how does New Zealand manage that uh, politically? But also the last um, um, years and particularly under the previous government, uh, Labour led government uh, governments, we've seen much stronger rhetoric and language to match the demographic changes in New Zealand about New Zealand's place in the Pacific uh, and very strong sense in terms of New Zealand's Pacific identity. So, how does New Zealand balance those two tensions, which are very much at odds? And I've written about this you know, quite a few years ago, saying at some point this was going to become. Uh, sort of the rubber was going to hit the road, and AUKUS uh, Pillar Two or another issue may very well be be that. And I think it would be uh, an absolute. Um, I think there's a, there's a there's a number of dynamics uh, at play here, and certainly in terms of uh, New Zealand's anti nuclear stance and and the need to ensure that there isn't a conflation of these issues as well. Um, and in a sense to that New Zealand has to balance and 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 ensure that it remains relevant uh, to partners such as Australia and 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 others, uh, but also is cognizant of where we sit in the world, which is in you know in the Pacific at the bottom of the Pacific, and that's how and our demographic changes reflect um, reflect that. So this is a this is a significant tension, and I think for the Pacific Islands Forum, this was and one of the conversations I've had over the, the years, and certainly over the last few years, is what will happen, uh, and this uh, to the region if you have the two member states, Australia and and New Zealand, uh, caught up in some type of broader conflict. 
uh, in the Indo-Pacific and what will that mean for the Pacific Islands Forum? And there is considerable concern about the impact of that on regionalism. And so I think there's a, there's a, there's a number of sort of related discussions here, uh, but I think that there is certainly on, on, on AUKUS 2, on New Zealand joining Pillar 2, that's, it's, it's very unclear at the moment if New Zealand could even offer, to be honest, as well. So I'll probably just end there. Okay. Anna, thank you. David, um, did you have something to add? Yeah, just uh, quickly, uh, and, and just to say, I, I don't carry a pro AUKUS brief. I think we'd need a two-week conference rather than two-hour conference to uh, tease out all the uh, uh, elements of um, AUKUS. Uh, and look, certainly as I've gone around the, the, the region over the last year, there's a range of views both for and against AUKUS. Um, I, I think just to add to the discussion, I, I kind of, a uh, couple of quick points. Uh, I think AUKUS at the moment is, is a discussion. Any capability is uh, is years away. So that's the first thing to say. I, I think the second thing is just why is that discussion happening? And, you know, the reality is that um, China has lots and lots of nuclear submarines, which are already, already moving through the region and has lots and lots of more nuclear submarines on the way. So, you know, if Australia is feeling insecure and sort of has this... Um, reach this threshold moment of exploring this new capability and um, New Zealand's feeling insecure and wants to, um, you know, join the AUKUS arrangements. I, I, I think to look at that issue holistically about what's driving that insecurity and, you know, the reality of China's capability already in the region um, ha has to be an important part of that discussion. Thanks, John. Great. Thank you. I mean, in a way that sort of leads neatly into our um set of questions from Sarah Fetuani, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, which is really about how Pacific Islanders, island countries are managing geopolitics broadly um, in the Pacific, but also how their partners can effectively balance geopolitical issues with some of the non-traditional security issues that have been raised, such as climate change and human security. Um, so there's the broad question of how Pacific Island countries see those geopolitical risks, but also how they work with their um, other partners to address non-geopolitical risks. Um, that's a, quite a broad set of questions, but again, um, for anyone on the panel who would like to take a crack at that, can I invite them to uh, share their thoughts? Perhaps starting with, with Stephen again, if that's appropriate. Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Oh, very good question. Uh, sorry, the uh, uh, non-traditional security issues and, of course, the uh, human security issues. So, uh, the geopolitical issues as opposed to human security issues. Uh, often the uh, the focus on uh, geopolitical uh, contestation and geostrategic issues tend to overshadow some of the actual everyday well-being and, and human security issues taking place in the Pacific. Uh, and from the point of view, you're talking about the uh, Pacific Island Agency, uh, they have issues which they deal with all the time uh, in terms of uh, addressing uh, climate change, poverty, health, education, and so forth. And often energy and attention is taken away towards the uh, high level geopolitical issues. So uh, yes, yeah, certainly uh, 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 at the end of the day, uh, and the way in which uh, the geostrategic issues are being framed by external powers, whether it be China or the United States, or Australia, uh, is often in relation to their own interests, not so much to the interests of the Pacific, but often the Pacific countries are brought in as legitimizing tools, as it were, uh, when China came in to try and uh, uh, get the Pacific states to sign the, the original agreement, which literally was going to make them control the security, educational, the economic aspects of uh, life in the Pacific that was rejected. Uh, and instead, Pacific Island states, they signed for bilateral aspects of uh, uh, of that agreement. Uh, and the United States came in, you know, uh, basically the same kind of uh, uh, document, but, but, uh, but, uh, but changed in a way so that it, it, it uh, uh, reflects the US interest. But anyway, uh, but but from the point of view of the uh, Pacific Island states, I'm sure that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's more towards uh, 
like the 2050 plan is more towards the interests and the well-being of the security of the Pacific rather than representing the interests of the big powers, which is very, very different. Yeah. yeah I'll stop there. Maybe Yvonne can uh, continue from there. Well, um, thanks very much, and I'm really happy to continue, but I am very aware that um, I have many more colleagues here who are over the detail and have been tracking this for a long time. But the thing I wanted to say here is that one of the realities I don't think we've faced yet is that we're going to have 20 million people in the Pacific in 2050. 18 million of them are going to be in Papua New Guinea. So that huge, and, and Anna, you mentioned that demographic um, component. Um, I'm not seeing that reality, which is something that faces our Pacific countries all the time when they think about the distribution of resources. That reality is going to be a game changer for the kind of door opening that Australia might want to suggest. You know, 35,000 is not going to do it. So there are some critical things we need to think about um, in terms of that. Obviously, some of, the, uh, some of the countries in our region have got scope to move within their boundaries, um, but many won't. The question will be is what is the nature of equity towards that demographic um, reality going to play out in Australia and New Zealand when our countries are sitting around the PIFS table um, with an uneven um, burden of, of future responsibility in terms of the number of children, the number of um, things that are going to happen. I don't want to talk about the, the social dislocation that will happen in that because I, I also have a, a firm belief that there's a possibility. I don't go down the track of necessarily demographic um, dividends, but I would like to see that reality of 18 million people sitting in Papua New Guinea in 2015. They're already born. They're already there, more or less. The momentum is there, and I'm not seeing that reality um, being considered by uh, a, a, across the region, although I am pretty sure that all countries are very aware of it. So that's one question I have. And the second one that I, the second kind of perspective I wanted to bring to this is that while we are, um, while we're in this, this space of space, the innovative space sector is also another area where I think future um, consideration needs to be given. And we've talked a lot about um, surveillance on the seas. But increasingly, um, some of the major geopolitical powers have got highly sophisticated surveillance from, um, from the space. It can be used in a whole range of resource um, um, allocation issues around tuna fisheries, but, but that surveillance technology, it's a technological thing. I'm not sure our governments have yet grasped the um, the extent to which that will become part of our future, future as well. Um, I mentioned drones only as I mean to say, this is where communities are going. They know that a view from above gives them a better picture. We can multiply that scale so many more ways. And then you ask the question, who are the holders of that technology globally? And you won't want to know the answer to that. That's a little bit scary. So I see the kind of that geopolitical discussion, and I'm sorry, I may have gone a little bit off, off scope here, but I think we do need to um, put some of those reality checks into our discussions of, of what our what we're going to do in the in PIFs and, and, and how our countries are going to have to respond to that. Um, Just Yvonne, before we, before we move on to David and Anna on this question, it, it, in a sense, it links quite nicely to the question that Jack Wasserman has raised in terms of what count as the immediate ex existential issues, Taiwan or the possession of the South China Sea, he adds, yeah. what about the implications of AI um, yeah. more broadly, uh, and then specifically on intelligence transfer, uh, whether legal or, or otherwise. So that question of innovation and technology that you raised, I think is related to that question. I don't know whether you want to intervene briefly no. on that before I move on to David and Anna. No, all I wanted to sort of really was to signal that there's a really important questions to ask. And the, 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 you know, I think Australia's got something to say about what they're investing in that technology and for what purposes. I know in New Zealand, there are debates about that at the moment. I know in, the, in Europe, there are those as well. And so we can't be naive about the way in which that um, intelligence can be used um, for alternative means. So no, I, I'm, I just wanted to draw attention to that. Thank you, Jack okay. and John. David, um, your vision of disorder versus order um, and your 
your positive statements about the 2050 strategy. Does that will that strategy address the issues that Yvonne was raising in terms of demography? Yeah, it, it, it is a big one, and uh, Yvonne is is right to um, uh, to mention it. I mean, I think uh, uh, you know, in terms of how is the Pacific handling um, geostrategic competition and the sort of distraction from human security and climate change. I mean, part of the answer is the twenty fifty strategy and uh, and also the Boy Declaration, which Anna mentioned, where you know it, it really is this very sophisticated, holistic uh, approach to security, and I think for um, the um, uh, forum to sort of uh, keep on that track because it, it does change the parameters of the debate and the policy discussion when the forum is um, uh, is making these pronouncements. Um, um, does the 2050 strategy in and of itself um, uh, address all the demographics? Uh, no, but it is a framework for, uh, you know, sort of um, looking at these issues um, holistically. Um, the other thing I just want to say is that uh, as, as I've gone around the region uh, over the last year, my, in my work, I'm, I'm privileged to um, meet a lot of the uh, Pacific um, um, uh, people working in the security sector. And I think just to say that um, uh, there's a lot of Pacific agency there. There's a, there's a pretty sophisticated approach to um, um, how um, all these countries, various offers are being um, handled and, um, uh, you know, oh, look, we, we can put that country over here. That's not going to do any damage. And we can put that country over here. That'll be helpful. We'll put that country over here cooperating in this sector. So um, I, I think um, th there's a lot of agency on the ground. And as I say, pretty sophisticated um, approach to sort of balancing between the um, uh, the uh, the various interests that are out there. Um, thanks very much for the question about AI. Look, it's the big one. Um, I, I think uh, um, I've had some initial discussions with some of the forum secretariat staff. It's it's on everyone's agenda, but um, uh, I, I don't think anywhere in the world that uh, um, we've got sort of any easy answers on that. But um, I, I would imagine it's something that the forum will increasingly focus on in the next few years. But um, uh, you're right, Jack, it is the issue of our times. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anna. Thanks, John, and and thanks, Sarah, for the for, for the question. I think I, probably I, Steve and 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 Yvon and, and and Dave have captured uh, the the responses uh, and the answers to this very well. I think I would just like to probably reiterate what uh, what what David said too that the. The region is, and and officials within the region are extremely uh, adept and skilled at managing and balancing and hedging uh, geopolitical interests uh, to secure regional and, in a number of cases, national interests. And we only need to look at, for instance, Solomon Islands uh, as a as a as a good example of that. Um, so so obviously we need to keep that in mind too. Where it does become uh, where where it slips from distraction to disruption, though, is particularly when we have the level of uncoordinated uh, effort amongst partner countries, and that is obviously something which the Pacific Arts Forum has been calling to address, uh, dating back to the Cairns Compact, uh, good sort of twenty years ago, and which the Pacific Islands, uh, the partners of the Blue Pacific. Are, are seeking to to address as well, and there's a tension there too between coordination and cooperation, as well, and that's where things can get quite disruptive. And then, of course, on the other side of that too, there is uh, we also need to acknowledge that there are a number of initiatives by other partners, such as China, who which has also been disruptive as well. And and that's where you and as Steve said, uh, Steve said at the at the outset, that's where P officials are being pulled away from the essential work that they need to be doing to, to manage and to respond uh, to these issues. And, and certainly I, I recall you know, 2014 in Fiji after the elections in Fiji and, and, uh, and sort of the opening up again of Fiji and, and a week of, of um, uh, I was there teaching at the university, but there was a, a week where every single country possible paraded through. Um, and all were, you know, felt that the visits were highly successful and, and they got everything they wanted. Um, and speaking to Fijian officials at the time, it was, it was, it was a little bit of a different picture and it was frustrating as well, uh, too. And so we also need to sort of keep that in mind, too, that, they, that whilst there is, you know, uh, very skilled officials in the region, um, without a doubt, and this is, 
and and strategic competition is not new to the Pacific. It's not something which has just occurred in the last ten years. This is by no means new. Um, the development needs, and as, as Yvonne has talked about, those development needs, whether they be demographic, youth bulge, health, and so forth, are becoming that much more critical, and they're intersecting with these other challenges too. So the ability to manage that is going to be at the core of the ability of this, ensuring that we don't enter into this regional disorder, as Stephen and, and David have talked about. Thank you. Uh, and Anna, your point about external actors brings us neatly to the last question, another question from Marco regarding, and this is really directed at you, David, which is to what extent is your vision of order dependent on an American-defined or American-led Indo-Pacific strategy um, at the expense of other factors that might be equally important in understanding regional instability, whether that's climate breakdown, underdevelopment, or the denial of political self-determination? No, thanks very much, uh, John. Look, that, that that's a big question. Um, um, the, the short answer is no, it doesn't depend on a, an American-led uh, Indo-Pacific order. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, 25 years to go till uh, 2050. But um, as I mentioned, I, I think sort of a multipolar um, uh, sort of global system, which will apply in the Indo-Pacific as well, is... Um, uh, is more likely, and the members of the Pacific Islands Forum will have to find their way um, in in that multipolar world. So, um, I think that the uh, post Cold War um, and post World War II um, strategic system that has applied um, in the uh, in the Pacific and perhaps more broadly around the world um, that, that that has gone kind of thing. Not not entirely, of course, but. Um, you know that the unipolar moment of the 1990s um, and early 2000s ha has gone, and I think um, it is a matter of preparing for a multipolar world. Um, um, China is not going anywhere. You know, largest economy, largest population. India, enormous economy, enormous population, and um, uh, and uh, and so on and so on. And uh, I think that's the world that um, uh, we will all be living with in uh, in uh, 2050. Um, I think, you know, the US has um, a role to play and an important role to play and will continue to play an important role um, in the uh, Pacific and the wider Indo-Pacific, but it's not going to be a unipolar uh, role. Thanks, John. Thanks, David. Um, before I wrap up, are there any other, other thoughts that panellists would like to share, um, either on some of the questions we've raised or, or on one another's insights and observations? Stephen. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just in relation to your... Your, your question on uh, multipolar or not, and the dynamics of uh, of global and regional. And what we've seen now is um, not so much multipolar in the sense of uh, concentration of power in two or three or more powers, but rather what we see here, uh, alliances revolving around the US, for instance, a power. And then you have Australia is not really a power uh, of the same level as China or Australia of, or the US, but alliances within it and the European Union against Russia and so forth. It was much more complex than simply multipolar. Um, and those alliances very much revolve around just one or two major powers, either China here, uh, Russia there, and the United States. So, uh, um, yeah, so uh, during the Cold War, I talk about the nuclear testing in the Pacific. Uh, they were told, the Pacific people were told, oh, this is for your security. Uh, there was a very interesting uh, documentary done on when the Americans uh, tested the bombs on Bikini. And uh, the people were relocated to Rongalap Island. And they were told, look, this is for your security. This is for your future. And this is for your life. And of course, what happened? A lot of them died of uh, the impact of, um, of, uh, uh, of uh, nuclear testing. And the consequences, as uh, Yvonne mentioned earlier, still there genetically in their body, um, you know, uh, and uh, the island was devastated and so forth. So, uh, 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 and it's nothing new. Now we're hearing exactly the same tone with Australia's uh, nuclear submarines. This is for your security. Um, and then what happened with the Cold War? Nothing. Uh, and uh, now it's replaying itself uh, as if we have very short memories 
of what happened uh, during the Cold War. So yeah, uh, uh, history replays itself. What we have learned from history is that we haven't learned from history. So we need to continue to look backwards in order to look forwards or walk backwards in order to look to that's, the future. That's one of the, uh, uh, the, if you like, the cosmological wisdom used in the Pacific uh, over the years, that uh, the future is actually in the past. Hmm. Can I, can I um, leave you all with one final question? Um, uh, David, I think you described this as a sophisticated approach on the part of Pacific Island countries in addressing some of these complex and over overlaying issues. Um, for countries outside the region, here we are sitting in the UK observing this complex set of developments. Um, and I'm mindful of Yvonne's observations about the role of civil society. Are there any useful lessons that could be applied out of region that we should be thinking about? From the vantage point of either Europe or North America or elsewhere. Uh, another big question, uh, John. Uh, I'll start, but I'm sure others will have views as well. But um, I think uh, Anna has um, um, uh, was right and uh, covered the terrain where you know that um, coordination, um, uh, you know, between uh, um, uh, countries outside the region, so that uh, um, uh, sort of uh, activities and uh, help and capability that's been delivered on the ground is. Um, actually uh, useful i mean um uh, competition in and of itself is not the problem but um, as, as anna has said that um, um shift from uh, um you know uh, helpfulness and more resources to you know disruption and distraction from um, uh, the real issues is um uh is, is you know is, is a real factor so uh, um so yeah th th there's no sort of easy answers uh, to that but um I think uh, you know respecting Pacific agency, um, um, listening is a is a big um, big thing. I think uh, I would just say of um, you know Australia uh, um, having been involved in Australian policy making that uh, in the Pacific there's you know this enormous um, you know sort of Pacific um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, bureaucratic infrastructure in Canberra kind of thing, but the you know the policy cycles and um, resources uh, um, uh, in in Canberra not, don't necessarily match the policy cycles and resources in Pacific Island countries, and I think being conscious of that and leaning into that and um, um, you know being you know it, it, it's not hard kind of thing in the sense of you know genuinely listening and um, um, genuinely working in partnership. You know in, in theory it's not hard, but um, uh, the, the practice seems to be harder than it should be. So, and and, and that that that's really true of um, I think um, uh, every country um, looking to partner with the Pacific. Thanks, John. Thanks, David. Uh, Anna, any final thoughts on this question? Right. It's, thank, thanks, John. I think I'll probably just add to that is, um, is that despite the rhetoric that we uh, have heard from both, uh, so New Zealand, Australia. US and other partners uh, with respect to the Pacific and and we've seen you know a number of recalibrations of foreign policies with so the Pacific reset the step up the UK um, Pacific pledge uh, the sorry the pivot the US Pacific pledge uh, and a number of others um I I am still of the view that partners are uncomfortable particularly the closer you get to the sense of center of gravity are uncomfortable with Pacific activism, ambitions, and agency. And until that changes, uh, we will still see the sort of the content, the same conversations taking place. Thank mm. you. Interesting point. Uh, Yvonne, I think you wanted to add yeah. something. I did, I did. Thank you. And I was just going to go down the same line. I think in the civil society space, global civil society, there has been a, a signal towards rebalancing, towards, um, you know, rebalancing towards the global south. In reality, that's very difficult. And um, many civil society organizations, global civil society organizations struggle to have that rhetoric, to, the, the practice match the rhetoric because it requires giving stuff up. It requires funds going directly into civil society in the region. It requires DFAT saying, okay, we won't fund through an Australian organisation, we will fund directly a Pacific organisation. Mm. Um, and that's not happening yet. So the rhetoric is, yes, we want to listen, we want to hear, we want to do it, but what we want to see are the policy mechanisms that shift and get that direct funding in civil society into the region. It's not happening yet.
So Very I think that's point. really quite a big, yeah. um, a big question to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, Stephen, can I give you the last word if you would like to have the last word? Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, to carry on from uh, uh, Yvonne in terms of civil society. Uh, earlier on, well, my, my initial uh, introduction, I talked about the different layers within which you can understand the Pacific, the original, national, and and local layer. That's where the local layer is where a lot of the uh, human security issues are being played out in terms of issues of health, issues of uh, development, issues of uh, climate change, which people... And that's where a lot of civil society organizations operate uh, in terms of responding directly to um, the human security issues, the well-being issues, the uh, uh, whether it's climate change. In fact, the strongest climate change, I was at, uh, at the last COP in Dubai, of all places they had in Dubai. But anyway, uh, so the civil society uh, uh, dynamics from around the world, certainly from the Pacific, was probably the most significant in terms of not only the being vocal, but also in terms of uh, the way they connect much better to the people than states. In the Pacific, civil society is always being overshadowed by the leaders, the states. Uh, although uh, in some ways uh, this, the forum has allowed for civil society voices to be uh, in the forum through a civil society desk, uh, but uh, always in, in the marginal, if you like, uh, in the margins of power. So, uh, yeah, I think it's important that part of the future, particularly young generation coming through and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the climate movement is being driven by civil society organizations, but the young generation as well, the youth tomorrow of, of tomorrow, that's something we haven't talked about. When you're talking about the future of stability, you're really talking about the youth, how do you prepare them for tomorrow? Our days as youth are beginning to fizzle out so uh, the new generation will carry on from there. Well, Stephen, that provides us with food for thought and possibly a theme for a, um, a future event, maybe, to consider the, you know, what lessons we might or how we might empower the youth of tomorrow to engage with some of these critical multi-layered issues that you've um, highlighted. Can I thank you all for a fascinating and um, wide-ranging, but also very detailed discussion it's been, for me, extremely illuminating, as it has, I'm sure, to our audience. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, we hope we will be able to do similar events in the future, focusing on Pacific Island countries um, and addressing um, this question of order, which um, hopefully will materialize or at least be reinforced in the future uh, in line with David's optimistic scenario. Um, all that remains is to thank you again, uh, to thank the audience for attending, and to thank our partner, the East West Centre uh, in Hawaii, as well as, of course, to our um, support staff at the Centre for Geopolitics. Thank you very much. That brings our webinar to an end. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.